Gustav Dalian should not have won the Nobel Prize. It was an accident, a mistake, a fluke. Scrolling through the citations for every award before and since Dalian's is unquestionably the odd one out. Here, let me read it to you. He won it for his invention of automatic regulators for use in conjunction with gas accumulators for illuminating lighthouses and buoys. Lighthouses and buoys? That's it? What could be more boring, more prosaic or mundane? There's no new science there, no mind-bending calculations, extra dimensions, undiscovered new particles or unknown forms of radiation. Just a series of small, technical inventions that made the world a safer place to live in and travel. And that's a fact worth bearing in mind. Dalian's work may lack the intellectual gravitas of general relativity or quantum mechanics, but how many lives was Einstein's work dedicated to saving? How much money did Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, or how much money was it trying to save his government? Scientists may from time to time inhabit their own private universes, but they also live in the real world, alongside the rest of us. And Nobel's prizes were intended to reward those who made that world a better place to be. Dalian's 1912 prize bucks the trend for what we expect Nobel Prize winning physicists to be like, but his award was entirely justified and richly deserved. This is the text of Alfred Nobel's last will and testament, the single most important document in the history of the Nobel Prize. This isn't just the birth certificate of the prizes, it's more fundamental than that. It's their first ultrasound, that first positive pregnancy test, the wrapper on that all-important faulty condom. Oof. What? Too no, much? No, no. Keep going. It's a very short document, brusque and to the point. Much like Nobel himself, by all accounts. What? Brusque and to the point? No. Short. Uh, according to his passport, he was of average height. Yes, but medium height in the 1860s would be short. Yes, but he wouldn't be comparing himself to people today, would he? Saying he was short makes it seem like he had an inferiority complex and was overcompensating, which is unfair and misleading if he was of average height for the time. After the personal bequests to nephews, nieces, colleagues, servants and friends, as well as a former lover, do you want to do this? As well as establishing an annual income for a former lover, we come to the important section. The whole of my remaining realizable estate shall be dealt with in the following way. The capital invested in safe securities by my executors shall constitute a fund, the interest on which shall be annually distributed in the form of prizes to those who during the preceding year shall have conferred the greatest benefit to mankind. The said interest shall be divided into five equal parts, which shall be apportioned as follows. One part of the person who shall have made the most important discovery or invention... Let's just unplug his microphone for a moment. You heard the important part, distributed to those who have conferred the greatest benefit to mankind. Now, there's a popular myth that Nobel was establishing these prizes, and the Peace Prize in particular, in order to assuage the guilt he felt for having amassed his colossal fortune through the invention of dynamite. After all, what more effective way could there be to ensure peace than by providing an annual opportunity for the world's foremost intellectuals to hate each other? Although he had always intended dynamite to be used for peaceful purposes, there was no disguising its lethal potential. Nobel's own brother Emil died at the age of 21 while testing the product, and many feared the Pandora's box that had been flung open. While he bitterly regretted the loss of his brother, it's uncertain whether he ever experienced guilt for his most notorious invention. In a skein of twisted logic still adhered to by many nuclear powers, Nobel actually believed the development of a monstrously powerful explosive would help guarantee peace. As he once wrote to peace activist Bertha von Suttner, perhaps my factories will put an end to war sooner than your congresses. On the day the two army corps can mutually annihilate each other in a second, all civilized nations will surely recoil with horror and disband their troops. Let's give him credit here. Both the factories and the congresses have so far proved equally ineffective. Oh, he's nearly finished. November 1895, Alfred Bernhard Nobel. The birth of the prizes is messy. It's impossible to know exactly what Alfred Nobel wanted to happen after his death, and we can only imagine his reaction if you were to see what's taken place since. Presumably, the angular momentum generated by his corpse over the decades would make for a far more efficient energy source than dynamite. Actually, he was cremated. 
One thing we can be sure of is that Nobel wanted to reward those who improved the lot of mankind, especially those who improved that lot a lot. In physics, those improvements have often been indirect, and so the award has acquired an image as being intended for highly theoretical work that need not have any direct practical consequences. That image has become ever more firmly entrenched over the past 113 years. Röntgen's x-rays and Gabor's holograms are among the few prizes that non-specialists can relate to. If you thought those were tough, wait till we get to quantum electronics and superconductivity in future episodes. At heart, Nobel was an inventor. Some would call him a scientist, others an engineer. It's difficult to draw a line in the sand and say that's science and that's engineering. Drawing a line in the sand sounds like engineering to me. But one thing he definitely was, was a pragmatist, plugged into the real world long before it had any working plugs. He was looking for practical solutions to real problems, solutions that could improve lives, save money and lead to further progress. The last great battle to keep the physics prizes out of the hands of theorists was waged in 1912. It was a crucial year for the prizes and one whose outcome has been virtually forgotten. The eventual winner was Gustav Dalien. Now, Dalien and Nobel actually had a lot in common. Apart from being born within 300 kilometers of each other in southern Sweden, both were brilliant, original thinkers who, in traditional Scandinavian fashion, directed their talents towards the improvement of society. And both spent much of their lives working with explosives for peaceful ends. Nobel with dynamite and Dalien with acetylene. Uh, can I do this one? Uh, sure, but uh, keep it short. You mean medium length, right? Acetylene, a colourless, flammable gas best known for its use in blowtorches, belongs to a family of chemical compounds known as the alkynes. These are distinguished by a triple bond between two neighbouring carbon atoms. Acetylene, as the simplest of the alkynes, consists of little else. This triple bond is both a blessing and a curse for acetylene. The large quantities of energy released when the bond breaks makes it ideal for use as a fuel, but it also makes the molecule highly unstable and therefore dangerous to use. If you compress it at just twice the atmospheric pressure we experience at sea level, less than the air pressure in most car tyres, it can go off with violent consequences. A balloon nine inches in diameter filled with an equal mixture of oxygen and acetylene has as much explosive power as 20 sticks of dynamite. A gas that cannot be compressed without blowing up in your face soon becomes prohibitively expensive to store and transport. In 1896, two Frenchmen named Georges Claude and Albert Hess thought they'd found a way around this problem by using acetone, a liquid which can dissolve tremendous quantities of acetylene at high pressure without danger. One liter of acetone at 10 times atmospheric pressure can store nearly 250 liters of acetylene, and the resulting solution is stable enough to transport. The problem appeared to be solved, but for some reason the explosions continued. What Claude and Hess had not taken into account was that as acetylene was siphoned out of the container, the volume of acetone itself would go down, leaving an empty space above the surface of the liquid that the highly pressurized and potentially explosive acetylene gas would rush to fill. It would be another Frenchman, Henri Le Chatelier, who first suggested filling the containers with a porous solid instead of a liquid to ensure that these empty spaces remained as small as possible and that their locations could be tightly controlled. So long as the acetylene only accumulated in the cracks, the small capillaries within the porous mass, the volume of gas would be too small for an explosion to propagate, and the container would be perfectly safe. For the next decade, acetylene containers would be filled with a mix of charcoal, brick, and other porous materials, which would then be drenched with acetone and pumped full of acetylene. The theory was solid, but in practice, the porous mass was not. Bumps and jolts experienced by the container would lead to the appearance of gaping holes within the solid, holes which would soon be filled by, you've guessed it, a highly dangerous and undissolved acetylene gas. You'd think this might have put people off acetylene for good, but far from it. Despite being deadlier and more sensitive than the Hollywood diva, the bright white light it gave off when burned made it ideal for use in certain situations where lives were at stake. This is London's only remaining lighthouse, here in Trinity Boy Wharf in London's Docklands. It's in the middle of nowhere. The only people passing by are lost tourists and cab drivers on scooters and training for the knowledge. It hasn't been in use since 1988, but any forologist would tell you it still possesses the two fundamental characteristics of all lighthouses since antiquity. One, it's a house, tall enough to be seen from far away, and two, there's a room at the top for a light. 
The technology might have improved in the two millennia since the great lighthouse was built in the port of Alexandria, but the fundamental principles haven't changed all that much. By the time Gustav Dalien turned his attention to the problem of acetylene storage in 1905, Sweden was nearing the end of a 90-year union with Norway. The two countries between them had a coastline that surpassed Australia's in length and rivaled any nations for unpredictability and danger. The survival of the Scandinavian shipping industry depended on a complicated and expensive system of lighthouses and lightships along the coast, whose lights were powered by petroleum and needed constant supervision. The government were desperate for anything that could make the process cheaper and more efficient, which explains why they were willing to make use of the famously unstable acetylene so soon after its discovery. It produced a far brighter flame than petroleum, and so was seen as being worth the risk, presumably for everyone but the lighthouse keeper. The unfortunate tendency of acetylene to explode was only one of three obstacles the Swedish government needed to overcome. The second was the tremendous waste incurred when the acetylene gas was used in conjunction with apparatus designed for petroleum. The existing mechanisms relied on valves that released streams of gas five to seven seconds long, essential given the weak light output of petroleum, but wasteful when it came to acetylene. The brightness of the new flame meant that a flash was needed only for a fraction of a second once every few seconds, which would increase the fuel's lifespan many times over. A rate of Summation devoutly to be wished, but one impossible with the valves currently being used. And the third lighthouse-related problem was the lack of a fully automated system, and the reliance, therefore, on those pesky lighthouse keepers always complaining about violent explosions. Even the most basic functions, such as turning the light off during the daytime, still needed to be done by hand, which made it difficult to light remote or inaccessible points of the Swedish coastline. Within the space of a decade, Dalian would have solved all three of these problems, saving his country a fortune and firmly establishing his reputation as a world-class inventor. Dalian was born... Oh, back to you. If you're done, sure. Dalian was born on November 30th, 1869, in the rural community of Stenstorp in southern Sweden. He was a bright, inventive boy whose teachers, in what appears to be a distinguishing characteristic of future Nobel laureates, said he would never amount to anything. At a young age, he rigged an old clock to trigger a match strike at a set time in the morning to set the coffee pot boiling, which sounds like something out of an old Tom and Jerry cartoon. He also developed a device to measure the butterfat content in milk which so impressed the Swedish inventor Gustav de Laval that the young man was persuaded to follow a career in engineering. By 1901, Dalian had become a senior figure at Swedish Carbide and Acetylene Limited, a company which had just bought the patent rights for the French process of dissolving acetylene in acetone. He took this work with him to the Gas Accumulator Company in 1906, where by 1909 he had become managing director of the newly christened Arger firm. It was here that he perfected the recipe for what he called agar masan, or the agar compound, a porous mass capable of absorbing large quantities of acetone while simultaneously being highly elastic and therefore resistant to shocks. The fascinating textbook Acetylene, Principles of its Generation and Use by F. H. Leeds and W. J. Atkinson Butterfield is perhaps the last great overview of acetylene to be published before Dalian's invention was made public. From it, we can tell that one of the secret ingredients Dalian brought to the party was asbestos. Widely known today as a poisonous carcinogen, a hundred years ago, asbestos was seen as a sort of wonder material and used in everything. I wouldn't be surprised if they made children's toys out of the stuff. At the same time as he'd been working on the Arga compound, Dalian had also been working on a way to improve the valve mechanism used in lighthouses. The patent filed by Dalian in February 1906 outlines the principles behind the new valve. A casing would be fitted with a flexible diaphragm, which was attached to a magnetic pin that blocked the valve when the diaphragm was relaxed. When gas was pumped into the casing, the pressure applied over the surface area of the diaphragm would exceed the magnetic force keeping the valve closed, and the diaphragm would rise, lifting the pin and allowing gas to flow momentarily until the pressure equalized within the casing and the valve closed once more. A permanent flame lit near the valve's opening meant that the bursts of gas produced flashes one-third of a second in duration approximately once every three seconds, an innovation that cut down waste by over 90%. Those of you who know your stuff and are getting ahead of me will know that Nobel Prize winner Albert Einstein made three tremendous discoveries in the space of one remarkable year, what has been called his Annus Mirabilis. At about the same time, Dalian would be solving the third of his self-imposed Swedish lighthouse-related problems, how to stop the flow of gas during the hours of daylight. This is the Solventil, or sun valve, 
a device so simple and ingenious I can't believe nobody thought of it before. It consists of a single black rod surrounded by three shiny metallic rods underneath which the gas is allowed to flow freely. In the hours of darkness, all the rods are of the same temperature and length, and so the gas flows through unimpeded, producing regular flashes throughout the night. When exposed to the sun's rays, however, the black rod absorbs more heat than the three reflecting rods, causing it to expand and block the flow of gas for as long as the sun is shining. The principle was so simple that many distinguished contemporaries were convinced it would fail. After all, how else could they justify not having thought of it themselves? The American inventor Thomas Edison pooh-poohed the scheme and the patent office in Berlin demanded a special demonstration before they would approve the application. In the space of three years, Dalian had single-handedly revolutionized the process of coastal illumination. His three inventions, the Agamasan, the magnetic valve and the sol ventile, were combined into what is known as the Dalian light, which was used in lighthouses around the world up until they were replaced by electrified lights in the 1960s. Instead of expensive light ships patrolling its coastline, Sweden could now make use of unmanned buoys. Note that buoys with a U. Buoys without a U were generally unmanned to begin with. Buoys that were safe, automated, 90% more efficient and 90% percent cheaper to install and maintain. The savings were colossal in absolute as well as relative terms. A single buoy cost 9,000 kroner to install and less to maintain, whereas each fully equipped lightship cost over 200,000 kroner. As there were 89 kroner to the pound in 1907 and one pound from the period is equivalent to 87 in today's money, 200,000 1907 kroner is equal to 195,505 pounds. Uh, who am I kidding? It's effectively one to one. Dalian's international reputation was such that in 1911, when the Panama Canal was nearing completion, Dalian and the Aga Company were offered $150,000 to light the route, which is nearly £4 million in today's money. Despite this phenomenal success, Dalian never stopped trying to improve on his method for storing acetylene. As he considered the experiment too dangerous to carry out at the Aga factory in Lidinje, he accepted a friend's invitation to stay at his farmhouse at nearby Albi in September of 1912. The friend was L. M. Ericsson, founder of the telecommunications empire which bears his name. Ericsson was in the process of expanding his farmhouse into a neighbouring mountain, and a hollowed-out section of rock earmarked to become the new laundry room was thought to be an ideal location for Dalian's work. Four gas tubes were left to hang over the fire and their behaviour was observed from a safe distance. When one of the tubes failed to behave as expected, however, Dalian and his colleagues reprised the Tom and Jerry routine and came closer to see what was wrong. The resulting explosion levelled the room and left Dalian permanently blinded. The news made headlines in Sweden, and the reverberations were felt all the way in Stockholm, where a small group of men were gathering together to determine the recipient of the 12th Nobel Prize in Physics. The play Twelve Angry Men starts out with one man, known only as juror number eight, standing alone against eleven others whose judgment he passionately believes to be wrong. Over the course of the next two hours, he slowly begins to overcome their prejudices and convinces them to do the right thing. When it came to the 1912 Angry Men, the role of juror number eight would be played by Eric Ljungberg. Ljungberg was a prominent industrialist and businessman, general manager of the world's oldest joint share company, whose first chair had been allocated to a Swedish bishop in 1288. Ljungberg was also a member of the technology section of the Swedish Academy of Sciences, and in that capacity profoundly objected to the direction he saw the Nobel Prizes taking. Over the past 11 years, he had seen the prizes reward increasingly abstract mathematical work, going to theoreticians rather than experimentalists and inventors. Dalian would be the antithesis to that trend. He was an outsider to the world of physics who had written more patent applications than academic papers. But Ljungberg was fervently convinced that if they were to honor Nobel's will to the letter and reward the man who had done the most to benefit mankind, they ought to give the prize to Dalian. Deliberations were intense. Seventeen great scientists were nominated for the prize in that year, one of whom, the Dutchman Kamerling Onnes, was the firm favorite for his work on the liquefaction of helium. Under mounting pressure from Jungberg and his colleagues in the Academy's technology section, however, the engineers won out over the physicists. Onnes would have to wait one more year to receive the recognition he deserved. 1912 would be Dalien's year. The man who had lost his eyesight in the pursuit of science was about to win the Nobel Prize. When Professor Soderbaum stood to recite the citation on the 10th of December, he took pains to draw parallels between the man whose work they were honouring and the man whose legacy had made it possible. 
The sciences that were especially favoured in the will of the great explosives technician Alfred Nobel, he read, have one common feature of involving, and sometimes demanding, the sacrifice of the experimenter's personal safety. Nobel's work in explosives had killed his brother and permanently damaged his reputation. Dalien himself had been blinded and was consequently unable to travel. It was with a fitting sense of symmetry, therefore, that Dalien's older brother, Albin, travelled to Stockholm to claim the prize on his behalf. Bitterest irony of all, Albin was himself a world-renowned ophthalmologist. Dalien was delighted to be receiving the prize, but did not let it go to his head. He shared the prize money with his workers, giving an extra week's wages to each member of staff, and donated a large sum of money to his old university. Thanks to the strong support of family and colleagues, the indomitable Dalien returned to work within three months and would remain as president of the Arga Corporation for the next 25 years. According to the company's official history, their most widely known product actually came out of Dalian's convalescence. Stuck at home, listening to his wife struggling to take care of him, he couldn't help noticing the difficulties she was having with their traditional cooker, which guzzled fuel and required constant attention. With the help of his children, he designed a new cooker, consisting of heavy iron castings, which could absorb and retain the radiant heat much more effectively. Drawing on the principles he had put to use with the acetylene valve, where a permanent flame could keep a beacon flashing for months, this new cooker could also be powered by a relatively low intensity source, such as a coal fire, which if kept burning continuously would provide the oven with a large amount of accumulated heat available for use whenever needed. The model, named after the company which first manufactured it in the 1920s, has entered popular culture in its own right. Arga cookers can be found in homes across the world, and their simple, durable design means that many still function nearly 80 years after they were first installed. Despite the tragedy which had befallen him on September 27, 1912, Dalien refused to feel sorry for himself. He continued to get involved in Swedish life, remaining politically active well into his 60s. His indefatigable optimism came in useful in 1932, when the Swedish economy was brought to its knees by the death of Ivar Kruger, the third richest man in the world, whom Frank Partnoy of the University of San Diego has called the original Bernie Madoff. Throughout the dark days of the Kruger crash, Dalian had pins made out saying, be optimistic, which he would hide under his lapels and hand out to those he felt were most in need of cheering up. If inventors are a minority among Nobel Prize winners, they are at least a well-represented one. Looking through the photographs of laureates past and present, a lot of male faces stare back out. Of the 195 individuals to have won the Nobel Prize for Physics, only two were women. Everyone knows about the first, Marie Curie way back in 1903, but very few people have even heard of the other. A Maria, rather than a Marie, she won the award 60 years later for her work on the structure of the atomic nucleus, and just like Curie before her, she would share it with two men. And if you want to make absolutely sure you don't miss episode 4 when it hits cinemas nationwide later this month, here are three ways you can stay updated. Firstly, you can subscribe to the 66mm wide YouTube channel by clicking the subscribe button down below. It only takes a second and couldn't be more convenient. Ignore all that small print about sending your soul to Beelzebub and spending an eternity in flames. Just agree to the terms and conditions without reading them as per usual. Secondly, you can flip me the small blue bird over on Twitter, and last but not least, you can visit the WordPress page for more information. As ever, I'm Gilad Amit, and you're finally off the hook. Speak soon off the hook.